Jacob and his family haven't been doing too well with the Lord lately. They've been living amongst heathens, people who don't know the God of his father, Abraham and Isaac. As a result of living around them, they've acquired some of the behaviors of the people who are idolatrous. Not only that, Dinah, his little girl, has been making friends with some of these people, and as a result of that, Dinah got herself raped. Well, her brothers didn't like that very much and went on into town and massacred all the men there. It's been a bad time for them as a family. God is beginning to work with Jacob again. And as we enter into chapter 35, we see God doing what he always does, initiating. And he's initiating this time with Jacob. And he says in chapter 35 of the book of Genesis, beginning with verse 1, Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there. Make an altar there to God, who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God, who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me in the way which I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands and all their earrings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree which was by Shechem. God will call you back. That's the mercy of God and the grace of God. He calls you back. And he gave Jacob an opportunity to fulfill what God had already spoken to him before. He gave him the opportunity to come back to Bethel. Bethel is where God had dealt with him, where he had uh, seen God face to face and had wrestled. God had blessed him at Bethel. Let's turn there. Uh, Genesis chapter 28. I'm going to look at verse 15. And I gave you, the reason we're doing this is I, I um, started mixing an occurrence in his life, and I wanted to get back and clarify that. Actually, this is where he saw the vision of the, of the ladder and the angels going up and down on it. And when I said wrestle, that triggered something. I said, you better clarify that and make sure you don't give them bad information. So let's look at Genesis chapter 28. What happened is there was a ladder here, and uh, it, was a symbol, it was a dream, and he saw in his dream a ladder. And God spoke to him in verse 15, and God said to him, Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I didn't know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Then Jacob rose early in the morning, took the stone that he had put his head put on um, put at his head, set up as a set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of that city had been Luz previously. And God made a vow saying, if, and Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and keep me in this way that I am going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I will come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set as a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I surely will give a tenth to you. Now, God is calling him back to Bethel. God had promised him that he would bring him back, and he hasn't gone back yet. And he's been delaying, and he got himself in some trouble. And now God is bringing him back. So God has called him and said, I want you to come back. I want you to come back to Bethel, and God will bring us back to the place where he first met us. And he wants us to come back, and he wants us to have a relationship, a renewed relationship with him. And the way that we have that is when we confess our sin to him. And that's why it's neat that we have that opportunity to say, Lord, I have blown it, I have sinned, and I ask your forgiveness. And Lord, I want to return. I want to return to that first love relationship with you. And so this is what the Lord's doing to him. God's telling him, come back to Bethel, make an altar there. So what does he do? He has to talk to his family. It appears that his family had begun to get a little paganized here. Not only his family, but his household, the entire household. And he told them, put away your idols. 
Put away those things that are keeping you from me. Put them away. And they're putting them away. They're putting away their idols, the foreign gods that are among them. He says, purify yourself. Change your garments. And when he says to purify yourself and change your garment, changing garments is, and purifying themselves or bathing or cleansing themselves is, is, is symbolic of coming close to God to worship him. God desires us to have clean hands and clean hearts as we approach his altar. And this is why we need to prepare ourselves as we worship and before we worship. And this is why we do need to have a moment, a quiet time, to prepare our hearts to meet our Lord. God desires us to have fellowship with him, but he doesn't desire us to walk into his presence carrying unconfessed sins and things that are going to hinder really a, rea a reality of worship. And you know as well as I that when you're singing songs to the Lord and you're harboring something in you, that you really don't enter into a time of worship because you know that you've got something you have to deal with. And this is what he's doing here. He's telling them, I want you to put away those foreign gods, those gods that are hindering your relationship because they're foreign, they're false gods. They have no reality to them. Get rid of them. Get rid of these things. Purify yourselves and come to me. He says, let us arise, go up to Bethel. I will make an altar there to God who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me in the way which I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands and all their earrings. Earrings were symbolic of the idolatry that they were in bondage to, which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them. Now, it doesn't, it's not as if he's just hiding them so he can come later on and pick them up. What that literally means is he buried them. He got them out of his sight. He buried them under a terebinth tree, which was by Shechem. And they journeyed. And the terror of God was upon the cities that were all around them, and they didn't pursue the sons of Jacob. And Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. He built an altar there and called the place Al Bethel. That literally means God of the house of God. Because there God appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brother. Now, Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, died, and she was buried below Bethel under the terebinth tree. So the name of it was called Alan Bahuth. Now, there is no indication about Rebecca dying here, but it appears that Rebecca is dead. And this is not speaking about Rebecca herself, but makes reference to her handmaid. And uh, it would appear that Rebecca must be dead also. And so they buried Deborah, her nurse in this place. They call it uh, Alon Bahuth, but that means terebinth of weeping or oak of weeping. Then God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Padan Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, your name is Jacob. Now remember, Jacob means supplanter, heel catcher, sneaky. There are different ways that you can approach the name, but every one of the ways that you approach it uh, brands him as a sneak or a usurper. And he says, all your life you've been a usurper. All your life you've been categorized as sneaky and a heel catcher. But no longer shall your name be called Jacob. Israel shall be your name. Israel meaning a prince with God. So he called his name Israel. And God naming him instills in him a knowledge of the character God is developing in him. God gave to him a name that was dem demonstrative of the workings of God in his life. And he called him Israel. So he called his name Israel. Also, God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, I give to you. And to your descendants after you, I give this land. So God is establishing his covenant with him at this point. God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. So Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering on it, and he poured oil on it, and Jacob called the name of the place where God spoke to him, Bethel, or the house of God. Then they journeyed from Bethel, and when there was but a little distance to go to Ephrath, Rachel, his wife, was travailing in childbirth, and she had hard labor. Now it came to pass, when she was in hard labor, that the midwife said to her, Do not fear, you will have this son also. And so it was, as her soul was departing, for she died. She called his name Benoni, 
Ben Oni, Ben in Hebrew means son of, and Oni means sorrow. She named him son of sorrow, but her, but his father called him Benjamin, Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. And Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar on her grave, which is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. And if you go to Israel and you're on your way to Bethlehem, your guide will point out the tomb of Rachel. They still have a pretty good idea where it is. Then Israel journeyed and pitched his tent beyond the Tower of Eder. And it happened when Israel dwelt in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard about it. This was, notice this, I want you to notice this, because he does, you know, there's nothing else said other than the fact that Israel knew about it. He knew that his firstborn son, Reuben, went and slept with his concubine. Israel knew about it. This act cost him the blessing of the firstborn. You'll see this developed later on, but it's not even really, there's not really a whole lot said here other than the fact that, that uh, Reuben did that and his father Israel heard about it. Now, the sons of Jacob were 12. The sons of Leah were Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. The sons of Rachel were Joseph and Benjamin. The sons of Bilhah, Rachel's maidservant, were Dan and Naphtali. The sons of Zilpah, Leah's maidservant, were Gad and Asher. These were the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Paddan Aram. Then Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre, or Kirjath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had sojourned. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years. So Isaac breathed his last and died, was gathered to his people, being old and full of days, and his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. Now remember before, as we were uh, as he was talking to Esau one day, he said, I'm about to die. I don't know the day of my death, and I'm certain I'm going to die any time now. I want you to go out, and I want you to hunt down some venison for me. I want you to cook my favorite meal. I'm going to die. He was 135 years old at that time. And he's telling him, I don't know the day of my death. Well, he lived to be 180 years old, you know, and I find that humorous that this man was so dramatic in his life, you know. Now, as we get into chapter 36, you're going to see that it's genealogy, Genealogies are very interesting and very important. Uh, they're interesting to Bible scholars. They're interesting to people who uh, are involved in uh, setting up genealogies and recognizing the line of, 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 uh, of heritage and all, but uh, I'm not really too interested in genealogies, and I don't want to read through all of chapter 36. If you want to read the genealogies, uh, feel free to do that on your own. But I'll mention a couple things that are important in this genealogy. This is the genealogy of Esau, who is Edom. You're going to notice that uh, Esau is mentioned as being Edom on uh, three different occasions here in, in uh, verse 1 and uh, verse 8 and verse 43. He's mentioned to be Edom, which is a land and uh, the land of the Edomites. And he is the father of the Edomites. And this is the reason why he's, uh, he's mentioned as being Edom. It says in... Uh, in verse 6, Esau took his wives, his sons, his daughters, and all the persons of his household, his cattle, and all his animals, and all his goods, which he had gained in the land of Canaan. And he went to a country away from the presence of his brother Jacob, for their possessions were too great for them to dwell together. And the land where they were strangers could not support them because of their livestock. So Esau dwelt in Mount Seir. Esau is Edom. Mount Seir is uh, southeast of the Dead Sea. And the capital uh, capital city of, uh, of this area of the Edomites was uh, the rock city called Petra, which is in history a beautiful place. It was almost impregnable, and uh, it's a place very, very, very likely the Jews will, will flee to during the day of the days of the tribulation for uh, safety. Now, one of the names of his sons that you'll recognize is uh, listed in verse 12. Timnah was the concubine of Eliphaz, Esau's son, and she bore Amalek to Eliphaz. Amalek is the father of the Amalekites. They were the first people to oppose Israel's entrance into the promised land. And the Amalekites were opposers to the children of Israel. You'll notice that many of these people are called in the King James dukes. Uh, literally, a duke was a chieftain. He was a tribal chief. Or they called themselves the dukes. They were... Uh, took upon themselves a title. 
and you see all the names, the dukes, the different dukes, you know. And um, basically, that's what you see in this. You see the genealogy of Esau. You see some interesting things. There is speculation, and I will not teach this as fact because it isn't established fact. But it's interesting because Aliphaz, as you see in verse 11, the name Aliphaz also appears in the book of Job as one of the comforters who came to him. And he was recognized as being a Timonite. It's very possible that Aliphaz is the same individual who came and spoke to Job. But we're really not sure as to whether or not that's true. But as I said, if you'd like to go through this, um, it can be interesting if you're interested in genealogies. Let's get into chapter 37. Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. This is the genealogy of Jacob. Now we're going to get in at this point into a man who takes up more space in the uh, book of Genesis than, than any other single individual. We're going to get into the life of Joseph. In the life of Joseph, you see him as being a type. He is a man who is uh, very much like a type of Jesus Christ. And you'll see his character and you'll see his behavior as we go through it. And let's look at him and I'll, I'll point some things out as we go through this. This is the genealogy of, of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Now in verse 2, and it says he was feeding the flock with his brothers. That word feeding uh, is, is a word that means shepherding. And it appears that Joseph, though he was young, he was the second youngest son, was honored by his father and was an individual who had character and responsibility. And as a shepherd over his father's flock, he was there with his brothers. He was there with Dan and Naphtali, Gad and Asher. And he was shepherding the flock. And he noted that his brothers were not honorable in some way. It isn't said. So he brought a report to his father about them. You know, these guys have been messing around, Dad, and, you know, that kind of report. Now, nobody likes a tattletale, especially a spoiled one. And that's the way they look at Joseph. They look at Joseph as being a little brat, daddy's favorite. And they don't like it. They don't like it at all. And so here comes Joseph bringing a report to his father, a bad report concerning his brothers. And in verse 3 it says, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. Now, Rivalry, sibling rivalry, is very destructive. And when the brothers know that dad loves this individual more, there's an, there's an increased hostility towards them anyway, just because dad loves him more. So these kids grew up with this little guy resenting him. Now that's bad enough. But there's also something that, that his father did. His father made him a coat of many colors. This coat of many colors was symbolic of leadership in the family. And being the second youngest son, there's no way that Joseph should have had that privilege of wearing a coat that had authority or wreaked authority over these older brothers. And there was a resentment in their heart because of that. So in verse 4 it says, When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now, Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. I mean, there's nothing he can do right here, you know? Poor little guy. He said to them, please hear this dream which I have dreamed. Now, he should have by now, I would think, known that his brothers didn't care too much for him. And there doesn't appear to be a whole lot of wisdom here with this little brat telling him his dream, especially when the dream is told. Look at the reaction to the dream. He says, there we were, binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And indeed, your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. Now, I don't think they'd like that. <laughs> Boy, they got mad. His brother said, shall you indeed reign over us or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. 
Well, you'd think that he'd learn by now that he shouldn't do that. You know, his brothers aren't treating him very nicely. They hate him for his dreams. But what happens? He has another one. He dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers. He said, look, I dreamed another dream. And this time, the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that you've dreamed? Shall your mother and I... And your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? So his father gets a little uptight, and his brothers here in verse 11 envied him. But his father kept this in his mind. In other words, he didn't dismiss it. He just pondered it. And he thought about it. And thought, perhaps this is true. We'll see in the future. Well... His brothers are upset at him. They're mad at him because he's been having these dreams, and these dreams signify that they're going to be serving him, and they're sick of him being their boss, and they're sick of him wearing this silly little coat around, and he's just a kid, and what does he know? And so his brothers went to feed their father's flock in Shechem, which is in Samaria, modern Samaria, which is 50 miles north of where they were living at that time. Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers feeding the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. So he said to him, here I am. Then he said to him, please go and see if it is well with your brothers and well with the flocks and bring back word to me. So he sent him out of the valley of Hebron and he went to Shechem. Now a certain man found him and there he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him saying, what are you seeking? So he said, I'm seeking my brothers. Please tell me where they're feeding their flocks. And the man said, they've departed from here for I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. Now, Dothan literally means two wells. What they're doing here is they're taking the sheep and they're looking for some place to pasture them and they're looking for some wells to water them. And they just keep moving up and moving up and moving up and they're not finding anything. And by now they're frustrated and they're going up to these place called two wells, hoping that perhaps there's some water there. They can feed uh, the sheep and water the sheep. And off they go to this place called Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dothan, which is another 20 miles up. Now, now this has taken him days to get there, and they're getting more and more frustrated by this time. Now, when they saw him afar off, even before he came near them, because they could see this guy coming in this coat of many colors, you know. They could see him coming, and man, they're <laughs> so mad. Oh, man. They conspired against him to kill him. Then they said to one another, look, this dreamer's coming, and they begin to mock him. Come, therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit, and we shall say, some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams. But Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. Reuben said to them, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him, that he might deliver him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. So it came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him. Then they took him and cast him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. They sat down to eat a meal. Now, can you imagine that? Think about that for a second. Their brother... Here comes this guy, 17 years of age, wandering up with his little coat on. And they say, here comes the master of dreams, because that's what it means literally when they say, here comes the dreamer. It's a master of dreams. Here he comes. Then they look at each other. They're frustrated. They're trying to find water for these sheep. They're not finding any. Here comes the rat, you know, the one who rats on them, has these dreams, and he says that he's going to rule over them. And they're fed up with this kid. So here comes Joseph wandering up, and man, the second they get him, they say, we're going to kill him. Well, Reuben says, no, that isn't right. We shouldn't do that. Because in the back of their mind, they remember God saying, if you shed a man's blood, then you should also have your own blood shed. And he remembers the law of God, and he says, it isn't right that we should kill him. He's our own brother. Let's just put him in the pit, <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, at that time, that was a good idea. Because he thought, well, I'll take him out once these people are settled down. But imagine the callousness of the hearts of these guys because they've thrown this kid into this pit, and the pit's probably good 20, 30 feet down. There's no way he's going to get out. It's dry. It's a dry well. And he's down there, and I can imagine... Now, I would be whimpering and crying 
you know, I'd be, I'd be upset a little bit. If they took my coat, they threw me down a pit, you know. I think I'd be a little bit upset at that point. And they sit down and they're eating lunch. And that shows the callousness. And you know, we are callous. We're so incredibly callous, we don't realize it, but we're so callous to the way we treat each other sometimes. And that's what they did. They were so callous at this point. They sat down and they ate. They ate their meal. They lifted their eyes and looked as they're eating. And there was a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing spices, balm around their way to carry them down to Egypt. So Judah said to his brothers, what profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let, us, and let not our hand be upon him for he's our brother and our flesh. And his brothers listened. Now at this time, Reuben's not there. So Judah makes this plan up. Then Midianite traders passed by, so the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. Then Reuben returned to the pit, and indeed Joseph was not in the pit, and he tore his clothes. And he returned to his brothers and said, The lad's no more, and I, where shall I go? So they took Joseph's tunic, killed a kid of the goats, and dipped the tunic in the blood. Then they sent the tunic of many colors, and they brought it to their father and said, We have found this. Do you know whether it is your son's tunic or not? And he recognized it. And he said, It's my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him without doubt. Joseph is torn to pieces. Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth on his waist, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. He said, I should... He said, For I shall go down into the grave to my son in mourning. Thus his father wept for him. You gotta put yourself in this man's place. He loved this, he loved this man. He loved his son. You know, he had a special coat made for him. He loved him. He invested him with authority and he cared for him tremendously. And when they brought back this bloodied up coat to him and he recognized it, it must have just torn into his heart terribly. You know, my little boy David, uh, I've shared this with you a couple of years ago, uh, when he was about Four years old, David had a little cape that he used to wear everywhere, Superman cape. And every Sunday, I'd see him flying around church with his Superman cape. I'd look at the door, and David would come running through the door, and I could just see the S on his chest, and he'd run past me. And that was my David. He was four years old, and, I, and he became a very dear symbol of my little guy to me. Every time I see the little cape, when I put him to bed, I'd fold his cape up and place it down next to him or whatever. You know, he'd sleep in it and stuff. You'd have to take it off. That little cape became a very dear emblem of my son to me. It just was very precious. When we went on vacation, he'd have to have his cape with him. And off he'd go whisking around, you know, and he was real sweet and I loved him. But do you imagine if he'd have died, you know, and they'd have brought a mangled little cape to me, how I'd have felt. My son has been run over by a car and all I have is the cape. That's what his dad felt like. He said, all I've got is this tunic. Can you imagine the callousness of the brothers who would actually do something like that to this old man, their father? They, they sold their own brother into slavery, and they perpetrated a hoax on their own father. And they watched this man mourning and crying and hurting, and he said, man, I'm going to die mourning for my son Joseph, and they couldn't comfort him. They were hypocrites because they knew he was alive. And they knew what they'd done to him. And they watched their pop crying like that. And they couldn't confess to him, Dad, we sold him into slavery. Well, it's interesting how God works. Because we're going to see later on, Joseph said, those things which you intended for evil, God intended for good. And something like this that I just, I just see only sin, God is able to redeem. In spite of the sinfulness of man, God is able to still save us and have his way. Look what happened. Now the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and captain of the guard. We'll see him more in chapter 39. But chapter 38 is an interesting thing. God allows us to see something in the life of, uh, of Judah, a sinful page out of his life's history. Now remember one thing, Jesus was descended from the tribe of Judah. 
and look at his pedigree. Look at Judah and look at the way Judah acts. This is the sin of Judah here. Now, it came to pass at that time that Judah departed from his brothers and visited a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. Now, he went, in other words, about eight miles northwest of where they were living at that time. And he went and saw a man and made a friend uh, uh, with a man by the name of Hira. Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. And he married her. And he went into her. And so she conceived and bore a son, and he called his name Ur. Now, Ur means watcher. She conceived again and bore a son, and she called his name Onan. Onan means strong. She conceived yet again and bore a son and called his name Shelah. And there's no real derivation. We don't know what Shelah means. He was at Chazib when she bore him. Then Judah took a wife for her, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. Now, Tamar was probably a young teen at that time, and, uh, and so was his son. She may have been a little bit older than him, but probably not. They were probably young teens. Now, er, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord killed him. Now, there's no indication what he did, what was so wicked. There's just a statement. He was wicked, and God killed him, and that's it. That's the end of Er. Well, let's see what other qualities Judah's sons have. Judah said to Onan, Go into your brother's wife and marry her and raise up an heir to your brother. Because the custom was if one of the brothers died, leaving no seed, that his brother, his younger brother, would take the wife to himself, would father children through her, and the children would be the heirs of his brother, his older brother. So he said to Onan, go in your brother's wife, marry her, and raise up an heir to your brother. Onan knew that the heir wouldn't be his. And it came to pass, when he went into his brother's wife, that he emitted on the ground, lest he should give an heir to his brother. So he didn't consummate totally. Uh, he went and he fulfilled uh, marital obligations with the woman. But rather than ejaculate within her, he withdrew from her and spilled his seed on the ground. And as a result of that, he did not want, in, he intended not to father a child. His heart was totally wrong in this, and he intended not fathering a child. So he consummated in a portion the marriage, but was not willing to fulfill his obligation. So what happened? The thing which he did displeased the Lord, therefore he killed him also. <laughs> we... <laughs> Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, remain a widow in your father's house till my son Shelah has grown. Now, Shelah is not very much younger than both Er and Onan, but I'm certain at this time Judah's afraid of losing his third son. His three sons apparently are wicked kids. So he says, remain a widow in your father's house till my son Shelah has grown. For he said, lest he also die as his brothers did. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. Now, in the process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died. And uh, Judah was comforted and went up to his sheep shearers at Timnah, he and his friend Hira, the Adulamite. It's interesting. I have a feeling that his wife must not have been a very great joy in his life. He named his firstborn son. She named the other two. And it appears that Judah was attempting to do things correctly according to the teachings of his fathers. But it also appears just by watching what happened in the lives of his children, that the children were going in the ways of the Canaanitish, Canaanitish mother and were rejecting the ways of Judah. That's what appears to me here. And I think he had some problems with this lady. You know, it's not usual that they only have three kids. He came from a pretty large family. Apparently, they hadn't been getting along for a while. Because it says that they had the three kids, she died and he was comforted. <laughs> <laughs> and 
and he left the party. Because that's what happens when they go to shear their sheep. He went up with his sheep shearers at Timnah, he and his friend Hira. The, but he and Hira went bowling. That's kind of what it is. They left, you know, to go enjoy themselves. And he was comforted. It didn't take much time. And he said, hey, let's go. Let's go party. And he says, all right. It was told Tamar saying, look, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep. So she took off her widow's garments. Now, she's been waiting for a while here to have Sheila given to her because she appears to be more honorable, and she's just waiting for him to fulfill his obligation here. So she took off her widow's garments, and she's been wearing these garments that make her obviously a widow. If you ever go to, uh, to Europe, you'll find that, that women still to this day wear widow's garments. In Greece, while I was in Greece, uh, the women will wear black. In Mexico, they do it in Mexico too. They'll wear black as widows, always, every day. And they do that in Greece all the time. They're called widow's garments. She covered herself with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in an open place which was on the way to Timnah, for she saw that Sheila was grown. So Sheila obviously was going with his dad to go shear some sheep. And she saw him coming up there with, with Judah, and he was grown. And she's thinking to herself, how come she uh, hasn't gotten this guy as her husband yet? She saw that Sheila was grown, and uh, she was not given to him as a wife. Now she's dressed like a prostitute there, sitting on the side of the road. So when Judah saw her, he thought she was a harlot because she had covered her face. Then he turned to her by the way and said, this is a classic line, please let me come in to you. You know, <laughs> talk about tact. For he, for he did not know what, <laughs> he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. So she said, "What will you give me, that you may come in to me?" He said, "I'll give you a young goat from the flock." She said, "Will you give me a pledge till you send it?" Then, then he said, "What pledge shall I give you?" And so she said, "Your signet and cord and your staff that's in your hand." Then he gave them to her and went into her, and she conceived by him. So she arose and went away, laid aside her veil, and put on the garments of her widowhood. Judas sent the young goat by the hand of his friend, the Adulamite, to receive his pledge from the woman's hand, but he didn't find her. Then he asked the men of that place, saying, Where's the harlot who was openly by the roadside? And they said, There was no harlot in this place. And he returned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. Also the men of the place said, there was no harlot in this place. Then Judah said, well, let her take them for herself, lest we be shamed. For I sent this young goat and you haven't found her. It came to pass about three months after that Judah was told, saying, Tamar, your daughter-in-law has played the harlot. Furthermore, she is with child by harlotry. So Judah said, Burn her out and let her be burned. Can you imagine the hypocrisy of this man? It's incredible. What? She's been a harlot? Then we'll just burn her. Bring her on in. You know, oh, golly. Talk about in law problems. <laughs> when she was brought out, she sent to her father in law, <laughs> saying, By the man to whom these belong, I am with child. <laughs> And she said, please determine whose these are, the signet and cord and staff. Well, they were Judah's. Judah recognized them. Judah acknowledged them and said, she's been more righteous than I because I didn't give her to Sheila, my son. And he never knew her again. Now, I believe that our sins will find us out. I believe it. This guy thought that he did an innocent thing. There was a harlot on the side of the road in his moral condition that was okay. It appears that he found comfort in her arms and possibly had gotten used to doing that if he had a bad marriage, which I suppose that he did. And it was something kind of normal. Now he'd been withholding his son from consummating a marriage agreement. 
And finally, the lady did something that was equally dishonest. She deceived him. They both were in sin and they were both wrong. You know, God's going to redeem this too. It's incredible. He, Judah, recognizes that Tamar has been more righteous, though both of them have sinned and both of them were wrong. But he recognizes that she had a higher degree of integrity than even he did. And he remained away from her. Now it came to pass at the time for giving birth that, behold, twins were in her womb. So it was when she was giving birth that the one took out his hand and the midwife took a scarlet thread and bound it on his hand, saying, this one came out first. Then it happened as he drew back his hand that his brother came out unexpectedly. She said, how did you break through? <laughs> Now, this is another indication that there were Mexicans in the line of the Lord because his name was Perez. <laughs> now, we've already had Reuben. Now we've got Perez. I like that. Afterward, his brother came out who had the scarlet thread on his hand, and his name was Zerah. Now, Perez is where Jesus uh, draws his... Uh, genealogy from. Now, Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought, uh, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian, and his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Then he made him overseer of his house and all that he had he put in his hand. So it was from the time that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. I'm going to give you quick information here. Notice that he was called an Egyptian three times. He was called an Egyptian three times. I believe the reason he was called an Egyptian three times is because literally he was an Egyptian, but Pharaoh wasn't. Pharaoh and the ruling family at that period in history were actually Semitic people who had traveled from the east and had conquered Egypt, and they were called the Hyksos. They were called the Shepherd Kings. And there seems to be in the history of Israel a favoritism that took place in this period of time, and this is why Joseph is going to rise in honor in, in Egypt under Pharaoh. He shall be second in command. When we get into the book of Exodus, you're going to note in chapter 1 that a king arose who knew not Joseph. And basically what happened is the Hyksos dynasty ended and a new dynasty of pure Egyptians arose and began to rule over Egypt. And to an Egyptian, shepherds were an abomination because of the Hyksos dynasty that had been ruling for hundreds of years prior to that. This is the reason why this man is called an Egyptian three times, because he's a pure Egyptian. And he's an officer. He's a bodyguard. Literally, he's a bodyguard of Pharaoh. He was a man of honor and power, a man of integrity in the household of Pharaoh. He was a bodyguard. See you in a minute. Something else that this man was, Potiphar. Now it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph, and she said, lie with me, big boy. <laughs> you know, they're all so they're crazy, man. <laughs> you know, Joseph was a good-looking young man. She looked at him with these longing eyes, and I can see her blinking her eyes at him. But he refused. And he said, to his master's wife, look, my master does not know what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There's no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because 
you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So it was as she spoke to Joseph day by day that he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. But it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the house was inside that she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. I believe there's a very basic reason why this woman is so insistent that Joseph lie with her. Not only was Potiphar a bodyguard and an Egyptian, he was also a eunuch. In order to be an officer, he had to be castrated. And this woman wanted male company. And it appears that at this period of time, this kind of immorality was well known. It wasn't necessarily condoned. As a matter of fact, it was not condoned, but it was understood. And I'm certain that this woman, having married him either before he became an officer or marrying him because he was an officer, had no relations with her husband. And here's this beautiful man, this handsome man, this Jewish man. And she sees him. She finds him attractive. And she figures, why not? Why not? My husband's a eunuch. And so she begins to make a play for him constantly, every day, every day. She's telling him, not in even a subtle way, have an affair with me. When you look into the life and character of Joseph, though, you see the character of a godly man. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, flee fornication. And I really see in the life of Joseph a man who literally fled fornication. You know, unfortunately for many of our youth, we uh, have an oversaturated understanding of sex, and it is instantly gratified. Anything that you want to do, you should do, and it's all right. Amongst consenting adults, we're told. And we're told we shouldn't attempt to legislate morality and we shouldn't attempt to teach children basic morality in school. So we teach them how to have sex, but we don't tell them why they shouldn't. And we make it appear very attractive, but don't tell them about the incredible rate of teenage pregnancies. We don't tell them about the abnormalities that occur when a child bears another child, how the rate of retardation is incredibly high and the children due to the fact that many of the teenage mothers also involve themselves in heavy smoking, drinking, and drug taking, are producing an abnormally high amount of children with mental um, dysfunction. But we're teaching them that it's okay, and we tell people in our schools that you can't come in and you can't teach the Bible, but you can play Motley Crue during lunch. And it's all right to bring your hard rockers on who only sing about drugs and sex and the occult. And that's okay, and you can wear those kinds of t-shirts anywhere you go. But you shouldn't push your morality on my children, we're told. So you can't have Bible studies in school because you're infringing on their capabilities and they're too, they're, they're, they're too easily impressed. And therefore, you shouldn't do that. It's incredible hip hypocrisy. It is so incredible that it's insane, in my opinion. So we have young people who are at the height of their sexual desires and curiosity, the age of 14, 15, 16, 17, and we're giving them a gun and we're saying, put it to your head. If you pull the trigger, it's your fault. And we tell them how to do it, but we don't tell them why not. So we see in the life of Joseph an honorable child, someone who said, I'd be sinning against God. You know, one of the things we as parents need to do, and we as, we, as, we as those who have an influence in our society, we need to vocalize reasons for morality. Many times when you were, I don't know how you were, but when I was growing up, I, 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 I learned my things. My mom and dad talked to me, my mom especially, but I didn't, I didn't really have the kind of inquisitive mind as to ask my parents. I generally would talk to my friends and we'd laugh together and experiment and do those kinds of things. But in my generation, through the 60s, um, morality was a way of life that was never explained to you. You weren't supposed to kill, but you weren't told why. Biblical morality was a reality, but was not an explained reality. You weren't supposed to lie. You knew that. But your parents, we were told, 
are liars because they cheat on their income tax and watch the way they are as people. So what I've done as a parent is I've begun to explain morality through the biblical model. Now, it's not easy, and I'm not a perfect father in any sense of the word, and my children most certainly are not perfect children. But I've discovered that giving them a reason and opening the scriptures and telling them the reason that lying is not proper is because God says, thou shalt not lie. And attempting to speak truth the way the Lord would have me to do, I'm giving my children, hopefully, a twofold model, the spoken and living example. Joseph must have had a good amount of time with his father who was returned to Bethel and returned to his love for his God. And I believe that Joseph was brought up in the character that God desired for him. And you're going to see this character. He fled fornication. He got out of there as fast as he could. But watch what happens. As a matter of fact, he ran so fast, she had his garment in her in her hand, and he ran outside. So it was when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled outside that she called to the men of her house and spoke to them, saying, See, he's brought in a Hebrew to mock us. He came in to me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And it happened when he heard that I lifted my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me and fled and went outside. I don't believe they believe that. I don't. I think the guys looked at her and said, right, <laughs> sure. You know, because there's no indication that they chased after Joseph or did anything. They just walked out. So she kept his garment with her until his master came home. Then she spoke to him with words like these, saying, the Hebrew servant whom you brought in to us, came in to me to mock me. Now notice that she's blaming the husband again. Golly. <laughs> Whom you brought in to us came in to me to mock me. So it happened as I lifted my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me and fled outside. So it was when his master heard the words which his wife spoke to him, saying, Your servant did to me after this manner, that his anger was aroused. But it doesn't tell you who he was mad at, now does it? I don't think he was mad at Joseph. I think he was mad at his wife. And I think he was also mad because his honor is now at stake. And he's got to get rid of somebody God has been blessing all this time. He's got to get rid of somebody that has been a blessing in his life. Because of his pride, he couldn't back down. He had to back his wife's play and had to say, well, the Hebrew mocked my wife. So he is angry. But I don't think he was angry at Joseph. I think he was angry at his wife and angry because he recognized that God had been blessing him because of Joseph, and now he's going to lose out on those blessings. Joseph's master took him and put him in the prison. Now, this is a prison for political prisoners and not criminals, a place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy. And he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hands all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's hand because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. Notice the way God works in Joseph's hand. Joseph was a shepherd. Joseph was an overseer. A shepherd, let me quickly say this in closing. David also, King David, was a shepherd. Shepherds are used to caring for small animals. They're used to protecting and nurturing and leading and guiding. And God used the shepherding experience in the life of Joseph to teach him to be a leader of men. And I really see a correlation in the lives of these great men of God who were men that you'll find who cared for, in a compassionate sense, sheep, or were involved in, in, in oversight responsibilities. So you see it moving in the life of Joseph, where he was a responsible person overseeing sheep, but eventually he was overseeing human beings. Eventually he was overseeing an entire nation. And I really do believe that God does bring you through slow steps as he teaches you basic concerns and caring for people. And he moves you and moves you and blesses you because you are faithful in that which is least. 
And you're learning to care for those things which other people may not even care for. And you're learning and you're caring and God just keeps moving you out and moving you out. This young man here is blessed by God. He's in prison and he's still overseeing people. He's still caring for them. He's still blessed by God. And we're going to see in the life of Joseph that even when the circumstances cry out, be bitter, he sees God. 